Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Richard Williams. I'm director of the Wheatley Institution here at BYU. And on behalf of the institution, the university, and the David M. Kennedy Center for International Studies, we want to welcome you to this evening's lecture in a distinguished lecture in international affairs uh, sponsored jointly by the Kennedy Center and the Wheatley Institution. We're pleased to have with us Professor Abdul Aziz Saeed from American University, who is a well-respected, well-published, and, and very well-known authority in, in uh, the area of peace and with a special emphasis in uh, the Middle East and uh, Islam. He will be more formally and completely introduced uh, shortly. Let me recognize uh, the presence of President Cecil o. Samuelson, president of Brigham Young University, who is seated on the stand. We also have with us Elder um, Garrett Gong and Sister Susan Gong. Elder Gong is a uh, member of the First Quorum of the Seventy of the Church and uh, also an overseer of the Wheatley Institution. We're pleased to welcome uh, Elder Merrill J. Bateman and Sister Marilyn Bateman. Elder Bateman is an Emeritus General Authority, former president of BYU, and also an overseer of the Wheatley Institution. We have also Elder Benny, and Sis Benny Banks and Sister Susan Banks. He is an Emeritus uh, General Authority, and uh, we love to have him with us whenever he can make it. We also welcome uh, Baman Bakhtiari, who is the director of the Middle East Center at the University of Utah and a, a, a colleague and friend of Professor Saeed. We're happy to have him with us uh, this evening. Also, we have on the stand uh, General uh, Amos A. Jordan, who is a uh, former president of the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington and currently a senior fellow in international studies in international affairs at the Wheatley Institution, and Douglas Johnston, who is the founder and uh, president of the World Center for Religion and Diplomacy, and who is with us visiting uh, this evening as a visiting senior fellow in international relations, uh, also at the Wheatley Institution. He will introduce uh, this evening's speaker. Um, as is our custom, we begin these uh, lectures uh, uh, with prayer. Uh, Professor Donna Lee Bowen, who is the director of uh, Middle Eastern Studies uh, here at BYU, will offer that prayer, after which um, <clears throat> uh, Dr. Johnson, uh, Doug Johnson, will introduce today's, uh, this evening's speaker. Following Professor Saeed's address, we will, have, uh, we will hear from um, Doug Johnston, uh, with some commentary and, and response, after which we'll open it up to questions. Because uh, this event is being recorded, um, uh, we ask you to please disable any electronic device capable of making noise. And uh, the questions will be asked from this microphone at this side of the room. Uh, we invite students especially to have the first shot at uh, these questions. And uh, we will go uh, uh, till um, we've uh, exhausted our time uh, together uh, this evening. We would invite you to uh, move to the center. I don't know that there is a center on this side of the hall, but I can see that uh, some seats would be available more readily if you could uh, sort of move maybe to the center of the room a bit and leave uh, those vacant seats for those who may yet come. Again, we thank you for uh, your presence this evening. As Richard mentioned, my name is Doug Johnston. I head the International Center for Religion and Diplomacy, and I just must tell you what an honor I consider to be here at this marvelous university and to be able to introduce a very dear friend and a longtime member of our center's board of directors. But uh, Professor Abdul Aziz Saeed, a highly regarded champion of peace education, holds the Mohammed Saeed Farsi, Chair of Islamic Peace at American University in Washington, D.C. As a senior ranking professor at the, at the university, he's had quite an impact on the university itself, in addition to his many scholarly contrib contributions to the field. 
For example, Professor Said was the founding director of the International Peace and Conflict Resolution Program in the University School of International Service. He's also the founder and current director of the University Center for Global Peace, which sponsors activities that promote the kind of sensitivity and responsiveness to the needs of others that can actually lead to global peace. Professor Said has also performed consulting work for a range of government institutions, including the Department of Defense, Department of State, the White House, and the United Nations. He's also had special ties to West Point. As a Naval Academy graduate myself, I would normally be inclined to question his judgment on that one. <laughs> but because of the special connection of the Wheatley Institution itself to West Point, I will keep my peace. <laughs> Professor Said has authored more than 16 books, and his scholarship in the field of international peacemaking is without peer. So please join me in welcoming tonight's distinguished lecturer, Professor Abdulaziz Said. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Magnificent people. Yeah. And Professor Emily Reynolds, thank you for taking great care of me and also Professor Richard Williams, thank you. Yes. Let me begin with a prayer. Turning the tide from violence to peace begins with prayer. In prayer, we can nurture our light in the spirit of strength and compassion with the hope that it will illuminate the consciousness of darkened souls whose suffering has made a home to terror. We pray that our light be used to warm and give comfort to those places in the heart that have surrendered to hatred and despair and bring clarity and peace to their hearts. We pray for human dignity to rise from the spirit by remembering all of the men, women, and children who have lived and continue to live with fear and horror as present and constant companions. We pray for the military and civilian men, women, and children who themselves are struggling with the fear and ugliness of man's inhumanity to man. Let us connect our hearts and energies with the world and its being so that those poor souls who are caught up in the storm of violence May no peace. Those who would be interested in my remarks, I will try to be as brief as possible tonight. But those who are interested can contact my office and will be happy to send them to you. My email address is asaid at american.edu, asaid at american.edu. Let me begin with a few small remarks and begin with the question, where are we now in the relationship between the West and Muslims? between the West and Islam. Yeah. Where are we now? We 
are aware that we are at a crisis point. And as we all are aware of, crisis brings opportunity. Where we are now, in terms of our relationship, I refer to three stories. Three stories. Story number one is a story of confrontation, that the West and Islam are in confrontation. Clash of civilization. that Muslims and Islam cannot reconcile with democracy, modernization, or development. That's a dominant story. Dominant not only on a public level, but also a story that has currency among scholars. When you look at publications on Islam and Muslims, so we have, that's one story. Then we have a second story uh, that Islam and the West are compatible. That's the second C. First is confrontation. Second, they are compatible. After all, we are reminded that Islam is an extension of the biblicist tradition it's part of the Abrahamic tradition. That story is beginning to gain some currency. And, yeah. But there is a third story that I like to tell. I'm not alone in that story. Many others with whom I work. I call it the other C, story of complementarity that Islam and the West complement one another. My perspective is that throughout much of history, nations have met as rivals in a process of exploitation. And my first story calls for a different meeting, a meeting of people not as rivals in a process of exploitation, but a meeting where America enters into an exchange by giving its best to Egypt and Egypt giving its best to America. A story of exchanging the best for the best. Yeah. That's the story of complementarity. Yeah. That's so my next question becomes, how do we prepare for peace? Yeah. Yeah. Let me share with you some comments to re-engage in ways that make partnership for a better world possible. Westerners and Muslims must first ask themselves if they are willing to make new choices. That's when we ask the question, are we willing to make new choices? Yeah. The United States has the power at this time to, to select between two paths, two different approaches, two different paths, P-A-T-H-S. America selecting the path of the brave or America selecting the path of the strong. Yeah. When I speak of choices, these are choices that we have to make. When I speak about the path of the strong, America is strong, this is a familiar one because its actions are motivated by fear. America the strong will continue to pursue a hegemonic foreign policy strategy predicated on ensuring its own security in ways that other nations regard as threatening and contrary to their interest. That's America the strong. Yeah. Yeah. 
that's a path that has been pursued by all great nations, primary nations, superpowers. In my office, I have a map that was made by Idrisi in the 12th century for King Roger II of Sicily. It's the first map of planet Earth. And when guests look at the map, they keep looking at it. South is north, and north is south. Idrisi wanted to put Mecca in the center of the universe. So nations do that historically, to put themselves at the center of the universe. On the other hand, the path of America the Brave relies on the courage to make short-term concessions as well as bilateral and multilateral compromises. This path is one of leadership instead of control, leadership instead of control. In choosing this path, the U.S. response to mounting this order will be a concomitant advancing of more humane and global community. I mention this because I firmly believe that what is good for the world is good for America. I believe that. I'm trying to paraphrase what's good for General Motors is good for America. <laughs> but what is good for the world is good for America because we are, we are the biggest shareholder. Yeah, yeah. U.S. policy in the Middle East is a significant source of Islamic Western acrimony. When I travel around Middle East Islamic countries, during my presentations, students will argue with me about American imperialism, colonialism, etc. At the end of the evening, when we get together, they say, tell us. <laughs> and they are fascinated by our values, our culture, our civilization. What I have learned in my travels, what inspires the world about us is not what we have done internationally or what we are doing internationally. It's what we have done domestically. That's what inspires them about us. That's the beauty of this nation. Supporting change in the Muslim Middle East requires appreciating the positive potential of religious activism. Yes, yes. Yeah. Acknowledging positive roles for religion does not mean turning a blind eye to the fact that religions have also been used to justify slavery, imperialism, and opposition to workers' rights and women's suffrage. What is necessary, however, is a balanced view that does not regard progress as the child of secularity alone, and that acknowledges that the role of new religious thinking in participatory governance, public accountability, human rights, and justice. Yeah. We have to acknowledge the role that religion plays. I know my distinguished colleague Douglas has been working on that, and that's part of his mission. Like Americans, Muslims have choices to make too. They have the opportunity to choose between defensive, collectivistic outlook that underscores alienation between Muslims and members of other cultural and religious communities, and a more broadly inclusive framework that seeks, seeks to make traditional Islamic prescriptions for social justice, human dignity, and cultural pluralism more broadly relevant to the contemporary world. Much of the political behavior of Muslims at this time is deeply rooted in a deep sense of disempowerment, in a deep sense of powerlessness. When Muslims were powerful, as they were in Andalusia and other pieces of their history, 
they were open. So much of their behavior is deeply rooted in a sense of powerlessness. My next question is, what could be some of the burning, building blocks toward or an agenda of Muslim Western cooperation? I'll mention nine of them. One, strategizing for conflict transformation. Yeah. Generally speaking, current US and Western policies manifest an overriding concern to control the direction of events, whereas Muslims hope for change and cultural determination. Neither side is sufficiently vigorous in seeking points of leverage for nonviolent, constructive responses in social and political ills. Rather than conflict management or conflict escalation, we need cooperative strategies for conflict transformation. Conflict transformation, beyond conflict resolution, how to transform the conflict. Proposes to revive or recalibrate the Cold War containment framework is not going to work. It's not going to work. Yeah. We need to be, uh, when, when we look at Tunis, I mean Tunisia and Egypt right now, yeah, yeah. what do we do? Uh, one of the questions asked of me many times now, how about the Muslim Brotherhood? Yeah. 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 Yes, what do we do with that? How, how, do we, how do we deal with a Muslim Brotherhood? How can we, how can we deal with that? I will be fo talking more about that. So my second is to strengthen diplomatic preparedness. That's second block. Block number one I mentioned is to strategize for conflict transformation. Block number two, to strengthen diplomatic preparedness. Hmm. Diplomatic discourse intended to win trust rather than cause offense should give increased weight to multilateralism. Yeah. More multilateralism. That's how we strengthen diplomatic preparedness. Number three, very important for those of us working with peace, number three, insist on negotiated solutions. Negotiated solutions, as we are trying to do now in Egypt. Insist on negotiated solutions. Though governments may not wish to trumpet a willingness to engage with non-state groups, we have to deal with them. We have to deal with them, yeah. To, we have to engage with Islamic movements and give enhanced credibility to Western demonstration of respect for Islamic symbolism. We have to do that. Mm -hmm. Western policy toward the Middle East should not target Islamic revivalism, rather than seek to manipulate intra-religious rivalries between the Persians and Arabs, Shia Islam and Sunni Islam. Uh, we have to work collaboratively with both sides. And I would love to answer questions about that. In addition to creative Western policies that engage multiple sh stakeholders in the Middle East and South Asia, there is always much room for new Islamic initiatives. Muslims have to take initiatives, for sure, yeah. Number four, foster greater inclusion of Muslims in North American life, official life, governance. That's beginning to happen. President Obama has done and is doing a good deal in moving in that direction. So that's happening. What is compromising that is what we see the movement against building mosques in the United States and other places. So we have to Five, support change from within in the Islamic world. Yeah, yeah, support change from within. We are trying to deal with, deal with that now in Egypt. By contributing to the radicalization of young Muslims, 
Muslim men, the war on terror has done more to destabilize Muslim countries than to cultivate a basis for sustainable peace. Despite this trend, fostering incremental change from within in Muslim lands is among the most vital tasks for Western Islamic partnership. Yeah. That's doable. That's doable. That's very doable. And the United States and other Western countries can best support positive internal development by promoting political participation within structures, i.e., I'm asked about the Muslim Brotherhood. Yes, let them participate. Yes, the Islamists in Tunisia, let them participate. And Islamists in other countries, Muslim countries, let them participate. Six, use public diplomacy to listen as well as to speak. Yeah. I have had that experience after 9-11. A group of us was invited by the then Under Secretary of State for Public Diplomacy. We attended the meeting. A number of Muslim, Arab, and Pakistani, Iranian, with obviously scholars. Yeah. We attended the meeting. Uh, what we discovered at that meeting, and we were asked to also participate in a video uh, under the direction of State Department, public diplomacy. We went to the video to participate, and 90%, 95% of what we were saying was magnificent, very well received. It was being taped. Last 5%, critical. We started to talk about what Muslims, Arabs, and Persians are encountering in the United States. Everything was cancelled. Everything was cancelled. So what public diplomacy are doing, co-opting Muslims, Arabs, and Persians who agree with the administration. Uh, so when I say we have to listen as well as the other. Uh, foster number seven, advance intercultural and interreligious dialogue. That is very important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's happening. It's happening. But what we need to do more with interreligious dialogue, interfaith dialogue, we need to focus on issues, meaning Muslims, Christians, Jews, and others getting together, talking about what does my faith bring to the table to deal with the issue of poverty. What does my faith bring to the table to deal with the issue of the environment? What does my faith bring to the table to deal with the issue of violence and learn from one another? That's very important to happen. Number eight, support religious peacemaking. Uh, even when many of the, into, uh, you know, motivations behind religious conflict are not particularly spiritual in nature, religiously based peacemaking activity can help counteract misdirected forms. And number nine, to establish religious endowments for peace. And what I want to propose here we have a United States Institute of Peace that was established by the Congress of the United States. It's in Washington, D.C., very successful structure. They have a new building that they are moving to this week. The United States Institute of Peace promotes, and it was the alternative. Initially, as many of you know, there was a movement to establish a, a uh, uh, well, we have, uh, we have Department of State, Department of Defense. The notion was to establish a Department of Peace, but the compromise ended by establishing a United States Institute of Peace. It does great work. What I am promoting to establish an interfaith Institute of Peace, and for that interfaith Institute of Peace to multiply, to have interfaith Institutes of Peace. This would be non-governmental. 
uh, and it could be different institutes could be located in different places. Some of them, one could be in the United States or two. To begin with, one maybe in South America, one in Europe, one in the Middle East, one in Asia, one in Africa. These would be interfaith instances of peace to advance and promote what we can learn from one another, what are best practices in different religions when it comes to peace. Now, in my conclusion, I ask a question, why should we, why should we give life to the new story? Meaning, why should we give life to the story of complementarity? Yeah. My dearly beloved friends, Islam and the West, we are truly between stories. To work with the new story, we have to work together. We are stuck together. Yeah. We are here to live together. Yeah. And I will conclude with Mahyuddin ibn Arabi, a 12th, 13th century Muslim mystic, scholar, philosopher. In the 12th century, he said to us, my heart has become capable of every form. It is a pasture for gazelles. It is a convent for Christian monks. It's a temple for idols and the Pegram of the, and the table of the Quran. My heart, he said, is capable of many forms. Love is my faith and religion. Yeah, that's Mahyuddin ibn Arabi. Echoed by another Muslim, Rumi. When Rumi reminds us, I am neither from the East nor the West. No boundary exists in my breast. I am free. Thank you for your invitation, and I stand prepared to respond to your questions. Thank you, Professor Saeed, for a very rich presentation. There's so many things that uh, um, deserve comment. I'd like to just uh, dwell on a few for a moment. Uh, first was this business about promoting change from within, supporting change from within. All too often, the need for change is driven by one's own unfamiliarity with one's own theology, the lack of understanding. And uh, the, the best antidote for religious ignorance is religious understanding, particularly in a context where religious legitimacy trumps all, as it currently does in most of the areas in which we're engaged in hostilities. Our center's been involved with uh, reforming the madrasas in Pakistan for the last seven years. We've been enjoying some success with that. And one of the reasons we have is that our Pakistani-American project director, who's absolutely superb, grounds all suggested change in Islamic principles so that those who are participating can feel that they're becoming better Muslims in the process. Tell them what a madrasa is. And they are. I'm sorry. Uh, Joe just told me to tell you what a madrasa is. These are the religious schools in Pakistan uh, that gave birth to the Taliban, among other things. And as you might imagine, it's uh, quite a sensitive area. But uh, the progress has been uh, very encouraging. A part of it, though, is this business of grounding in Islamic principles. It's terribly important. Nobody over there will accept a Western model, so you go to their model, basically. Another thing I'd like to comment on is public diplomacy. You know, uh, 
Public diplomacy should be more about listening than selling. And I think in the wake of 9-11, the Under Secretary of State for Public Diplomacy and um, Public Affairs spent most of her time trying to sell America uh, at a time when there wasn't a very receptive ear for that. And at the tail end of the George W. Bush administration, a fellow by the name of Jim Glassman took over, relieved her. Uh, he was only in office for six months, but he got it. He went about listening and, uh, and setting the stage where people could come together and the strength of the ideas sold themselves. We didn't have to do any selling. So it's a, it's a nuance that escapes, uh, I think, uh, the observations of most people, but it shouldn't. It's very important. Um, another is uh, Professor Saeed ma made mention of interreligious dialogue as something that uh, was very needed. I'm here to, uh, to suggest to you that uh, interreligious dialogue as it's normally practiced and the concept of religious tolerance, I think are two concepts that are actually overrated. Interreligious dialogue, if it is a mere coming together and an exchange of uh, sterile views about respective belief systems, and then everybody tools off into the sunset and nothing changes. I don't think that's very useful. What is useful is if you bring people together to engage in that dialogue, but they also come with a commitment to meet on an ongoing basis and that they have an action agenda to pursue. Because uh, what women know from birth and men occasionally figure out is that all things are relational. And once you're around the table dealing with these problems on a monthly basis, you develop relationship. And from relationship flows trust. And once you have trust, all things become possible. And as far as religious tolerance goes, you just think about what tolerance means. It means I'm willing to put up with you. What counts is respect. I'll give you a case of this. It wasn't intended, but it worked out that way. Had, uh, I was uh, in a room in a madrasa that had been identified with terrorism uh, outside of Karachi, and the room was filled with rage, rage over U.S. foreign policy in general, and, and it was the peak of the crisis between uh, Hezbollah and Israel at that time. Uh, so we tried to explain, you know, give a balanced view of U.S. involvement overseas, but then segued into uh, saying that this is not why we're here today. We're here today to see if we can talk about religious values that we share in common and what good things can come out of that. And then I recited from memory several verses from the Quran uh, that um, made the point, if you will, that, they, that from their own scriptures, we appreciated the values that those represented. And uh, as our project director said later, everywhere we did this, there was a, an audible sigh of relief. The, the rage dissipated because it was just that, sing, that single projection of respect by caring enough to try to understand what's important to them, the values they hold dear, and then things open up. They really do. Um, finally, just on the closing comment about how Islam and the West are stuck with one another. That's very true. If you think about it, everybody in the world is stuck with one another. And uh, the, the opportunities for going it alone and addressing any major international issue of any consequence are fast disappearing. And we're absolutely going to have to work together. Three weeks ago, our center sponsored a, an event in Amman, Jordan, where 10, evangelic, 10 evangelical pastors from America met with 10 leaders of the Muslim Brotherhood in a faith-based reconciliation seminar. And I'm here to tell you that both sides learned a lot from one another. And this is the kind of thing we need for the future, engagement. The, the whole idea of refusing to uh, engage with some rogue regime because doing so will somehow give them added credibility, that's nonsense. We should, we should feel secure enough in our own right to engage with anyone. 
And that's why we need uh, more than ever to listen to the wise words of folks like Professor Saeed. So thank you very much for all you had to say. We'll now open it up to questions. And you'd like to? I, I can do it, yeah. You'll, you'll stand here. Okay. Yeah. Good. Open up to questions and thank you, Doug. Uh, the message I'm sharing with you when it comes to interfaith dialogue, there's fear of dialogue. Oftentimes, we are afraid to enter into dialogue. What I have experienced with dialogue is through dialogue, we develop new knowledge. There's no fear that the Muslim will become less Muslim, or the Christian less Christian, or the Jew less of a Jew, or Hindu less. In fact, the opposite. He or she becomes a better Christian, a better Muslim, a better Jew. So when it comes to dialogue, that has been my experience. And talking about part of what I'm sharing with you, the story about a person who was desperately looking for the keys he had lost. He had lost his keys and was desperately looking for them. A friend of his was passing by and inquired, uh, what are you doing? He said, I'm looking for my keys. And he came to help him to look for the keys together. Time passed, they couldn't find the keys. So the friend asked his friend, said, where did you exactly lose your keys? Oh, he said, I lost them in a dark alley behind, but there are no lights over there. I'm looking for them under the daylight under the lights. We have to look for them every place. We have to look for them, yes, through in inclusion with those with whom we disagree. So it is looking for them. It is, we are stuck together. Yes. One of the reasons that peace is more difficult than violence. Violence is reactive. Peace is proactive. Peace is proactive. It's not reactive. And that's, and, and working with peace with Muslims, Christians, and others, uh, we have, we cannot continue to look for it, for peace or reconciliation through retrospective. We have to look for it also through prospective not only retrospective, but it has to be prospective. I'd be happy to respond to your questions. Hello, my name is Mina, and I'm studying human development here. I believe that's normally the way we go about introducing ourselves at these. And I wanted to inquire, my understanding is, based on your name, that you are both Muslim and a descendant of Muhammad. And I wanted to ask if you felt that that was part of your motivation for your studies and your mission that you've accepted in your life. Part of my motivation for the work I'm involved in around age six or seven, the town, the village where I was raised in Syria was caught in battle against the French. Men were shooting at one another, and women, my mother included, carried us. And we ended up in Aleppo, Syria, and my brother, Riyadh, was killed around age three. Not deliberately, it was a military truck that ran him over. It was my task to carry him to my mother, and his blood went inside my mouth. Yeah. That's, and then my motivation continues. In Israel, participating in a conference, I asked the taxi driver to take me from West Jerusalem to East Jerusalem. He
he was reluctant. He said, they are killing people there. I don't want to take you there. But then finally he accepted, started driving, and looked back at me. He said, what are you doing? Where are you from? To shock him, I said, Syria, because Syria and this are at war. He was shocked. Then he asked me more, and I told him what I was doing. After about 10, 15 minutes, he goes on his radio in Hebrew. Then he finished, he said, Mr. Said, he said, I went on radio with our people to go on radio with the Palestinian taxis to meet you because we don't want to kill our chances for peace. After leaving Israel, I was going to Syria. You can't go to Syria from Israel. I had to go to Cyprus. Arrived in Damascus. Took a taxi to the hotel. He said, where, where are you coming from? I said, this I said, my God, Israel, the enemy. He was like the Israeli taxi driver in his early 30s. Kept driving, said, what are we doing? In Israel? I told him. After 20, 30 minutes, when I arrived at the hotel, he said, please don't pay me. All we need is peace. I said, are you communicating with Shlomo, the taxi driver? <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm here. That's what I'm doing. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jarrett Lever. I am studying linguistics and Portuguese here at BYU. Um, I'm also studying Hebrew, and I'm in Hebrew 101. My, one, my question for you, Professor Said, is what is, in your opinion, what is the role of Israel um, in developing peace in the Middle East and the West? When you say, what's the role? What is the role of Israel? The Israel, state of. I mean, Israel, like any other state, has people working for peace, people defending the status quo. Mm. There are many Israelis that I work with who are very much involved in peacemaking efforts. There are other Israelis who represent a position of whatever government is at that time. So when you ask me what is the rule, uh, if it can be more specific, I'd be happy. I guess to probably more specific, more specific as, as Israel is the only democratic nation ah. in the Middle East. In the Middle East at this time, uh, we have Turkey that is democratic and the Turkish administration that is democratic has come out from a Muslim party. Certainly, uh, we have we have Morocco attempting to work with democracy. The proposition that Israel is the only democracy, which is constantly repeated, uh, tell it to the Palestinians living in Israel. Uh, they will tell you, wait a little. We don't enjoy the same rights and privileges of Israelis who are Jews. So that's. That becomes questionable. Thank you. If your question is Israel the only state in the Middle East that has free election, yes. Turkey has free elections. So that's, it has to be basic context. Okay. Thank you, Joe. Hello, my name is Idris Sanjay. Um, I strongly believe that uh, what is really stopping peace is a lack of trust between people. So uh, listening to you, I think uh, maybe I, I may be wrong, but what you're saying is that uh, interfaith uh, discussion and religion is the solution to bring uh, trust between people. You are very correct in talking about trust. We in our business talk about the sense of the other, the emotion of the other. Uh, 
building trust is extremely important, is foundational. What I have been learning in my work in zones of conflict, whether it is Israel, South Africa, Middle East, other places, I've learned to address my friends that I work with when I'm with Turks and Armenians, I've learned to begin to say Turks and other Armenians. And I've started to learn to say Greeks and other Turks. And I've started to learn to say Jews and other Arabs. The immediate reaction, sometimes shock, but I said, yes, you scratch a Jew and you find an Arab. You scratch a Turk and you find an Armenian. But I'm trying to say, they are caught in that tragedy, that agony of the other. We try to look at the similarities of Shlomo and Mustafa, Damascus and Tel Aviv. Uh, yes, trust is very important. Very, this notion of mirror images are projecting on others. A good deal has been done in that area. So I guess what I'm really looking for is, uh, uh, will you say that religion will bring a uh, um, response to this problem instead of governments, like political leaders, all these guys who were saying, uh, let's separate sh church from, uh, mm -hmm. from uh, I don't know if, state. from state? I don't know if. Uh, I, I, I hear what you are saying. Okay. I mean, the challenge for us in the United States, now more than ever before, is to understand and appreciate, going back to what Doug Johnson was speaking earlier, the role that religion plays in dealing with diplomats. Oftentimes hard to appreciate to deal with religion as a factor. It's becoming more recognized, more acknowledged, that while true religion historically has been used in abusive ways, religion has great foundation for trust building, peacemaking. That's what more and more, hence my plea to establish an interfaith institute of peace emanates from that <coughs> belief commitment that indeed religion has a force for peace is critical. Thank you. Oh, please go ahead. Let me just bring that uh, alive for you just a little bit more. Uh, I mentioned uh, uh, reciting these verses from the Quran. Uh, the paraphrase of those verses is, Oh, mankind, God could have made you one had he willed, but he did not. He made you into separate nations and tribes that you may know one another, cooperate with one another, and compete with one another in good works. And I said that, uh, then I said, I and my two colleagues who have, uh, have come with me happen to be followers of Jesus. And we know that you can't be good Muslims unless you believe some pretty wonderful things about Jesus. So he said, let's, uh, let's ask ourselves, how should we behave toward one another if he were here in our presence? And over the course of the next hour, as that played out uh, and segued into a, a bit of a social function, that rage had dissipated to a, a posture of total acceptance bordering on fellowship. You couldn't get there using government talk. You know, This is what hits people at their heart. This is what gives 90% of the people on the planet their reason for being. You just can't continue to ignore religion as we have seemingly done in so many aspects. So. Well, that's, uh, thank you. Thank you, Marcus. That's, uh, in discussion earlier with colleagues of mine who are on your faculty here. I shared the experience at some young diplomats meeting with me, asking me what books they should read to deal more effectively with Iranians, Arabs. Well, I said, uh, begin by reading a book by Attar, Farid entitled Conference of the Birds, and begin to understand the culture, the context. We in international relations 
we have decontextualized politics. We have to place it in context. And when we, in my training, similar to most of you here, I was trained in the United States in higher education. And in my training in higher education, what I, what I have been told to accept in looking at big events, big conflicts, uh, uh, focus on the material, the technological, the economic, that which can be quantified. By doing that and overlooking emotions, feelings, and beliefs, we, we place it out of context. So what happens, we reduce, we reduce substance of, to phenomena, to generalizations, fundamentalism, et cetera, et cetera. So part, that's part of the challenge, yeah? So yes, to deal with Arabs, Muslims, we have to read Attar. We have to read Conference of the Birds. And we have to read similar works, yes? Recently, I met a young American diplomat who was highly loved in the Arab country where he serves, and I discovered why. They said, well, uh, he recites poetry when we talk with him, we deal with him, he understands our culture. That's, that's what mattered a great deal. Yeah. I, was, I was expecting to say he knows uh, history, diplomacy, international law. I'm sure he knows all of that too. Yeah. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam. I was uh, thinking about the first building block, which you said was not resolving conflict, but transforming that conflict. Could you clarify that a little bit more? And does that have something to do with the higher concept of jihad, the personal conflict against evil emotions, sins, personal weakness, etc.? That's why when we look at peace programs, it is important to, to recognize the language. Some of us talk about uh, departments of conflict management. Some of us use the term conflict resolution. Some of us use the term conflict transformation. What conflict management and conflict resolution do not do, they do not transform the conflict. They do not transform the power relationship between the conflicting parties. Uh, what they do, they, they resolve that conflict, but power relationship continues to be one very high, one very low. The disparity in power continues to be one high, one low. Connected with that is the other notion mentioned in transformation, inner transformation. That is, you mentioned jihad. What jihad has to do is what is spiritual inner struggle for refinement. Abused by others to use it against others. So transformation indeed results in, in altering the relationship of power. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you very much. Professor Said, thank you very much for your visit, for your words, for your wisdom. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attendance, and we hope to see you again at uh, the next event. Thank you.